What's up, everyone? I know it's late. Sorry to do it to you. But um, I was, I've been hanging around the studio looking through old hard drives, which is um, one of my favorite things to do, one of my favorite pastimes. Other than that, I like to uh, look through old cassette, oh, cas old boxes of cassettes and see what I have. I have stuff going back to the 70s that I made, definitely. Um, and it's um, greetings to everybody. I see you, I see you all. I didn't say y'all, though. Um, <laughs> Deb, cassettes rule, they do. I love cassettes. Uh, yeah, so I, I was copying stuff over. I, you periodically have to copy stuff over from drives. I had two drives that just would not come up tonight. And unfortunately, that stuff is lost forever. The things that were on those drives, the projects... Um, uh, and I don't even know what was on them, honestly. It's, um, I'm look, I've been looking for a particular track Pro Tools session that I cannot find. Absolutely cannot find it. My buddy Jason's record, I can't find the whole record. I do not know what happened to it. Really, really bugs me. Um, anyways, so I've been uh, working on ideas for some new videos. And, um, you know, this channel is getting close to 18,000 subscribers, even by putting no, um, even by putting no tags or anything on it, it's still getting subscribers. It kind of bums me out. Just kidding. Um, let's see here. Any chance I could explain Blue Up the Outside World? C major sounds minor in the key of E. Is it because of relative minor? Um, um, well, I, I don't think it sounds minor. <laughs> In the key of E, but um, uh, I love that song. Actually, that Soundgarden song. It's a great song. Love the outside. Really great song. Um, you know, I uh, um, might need a third secret channel. I think that's true. I I I uh, I think that's true, Aaron. That that uh, need to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of working on a documentary. I've been working on a bunch of different stuff. Um, but I see people asking me theory questions here. Um, I'd get my guitar out, which is sitting about three feet from me, but, or no, it's about eight feet from me, but I'm in, sitting in a chair that has arms, which is not good for playing guitar, and I don't feel like moving, because I have to lower the height of my stand here, but, um, way too far away, exactly, I sound tired, um, I'm starting to have allergies again, this, uh, this, this time of year, you hear my voice kind of get con uh, sound congested and it sounds tired. Um, and it's sometimes I'll sneeze a hundred times in a row and it, um, and it just is, uh, it messes, really messes up my voice. Um, I did not see Bohemian Rhapsody. I don't do drugs. Um, my friend Pat just called me because I didn't turn off the uh, my my phone. 
Allison Chains Unplugged was on today. Oh, you know what? I was thinking about doing my second Allison Chains video tomorrow. Um, what makes this song great? Maurizio, what's up? You have a couple things you want to ask me? Email me, man. Did I ever sing backup in any band? I always sing backup in bands. How long should it take to get to page 75 for a beginner in my book? I don't know. You probably do it in about three or four seconds. Depends on how fast you can flip through the pages. Was there a song that made me want to make a record? Chris. Hmm. Hmm. I'm not sure if there's a, you know, that question about page 75, that's like one of the, what you, they ask in a uh, IQ test. One of those kind of things. Uh, it does not help my channel if you watch the ads, skip through them, it has nothing to do with them. It's all about views. What makes this song mediocre? Um, So I've been thinking a lot about this um, uh, some people send me these videos all the time about um, uh, about the internet and about selling music and my, like my buddy <laughs> my buddy Pat calls me tonight today and he was saying like yeah I wanna I wanna remaster my record, take a couple songs out of it and, and print more CDs. And I said, Pat, what what do you mean print CDs? Who makes CDs? No one has CD players anymore. They don't have them. They're not in any computers. Nobody uses them. Why would you make CDs? Only old guys that are jazz, uh, jazz musicians make CDs. I mean, it's it's... It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> so this kind of, um, they're expensive coasters. I know, I said, I said, you'll never make your money back. You buy, Deb, you buy CDs. Well, you have a CD. Okay. I'm just saying it doesn't make, it's not worth it to buy CDs. Okay. It's not worth it to print CDs. Just not. You'll never make your money back. Well, Pat wouldn't, anyways. Um, there's just not enough people that have them. So that kind of gets to the point, though, about... Um, like, one of my buddies sent me a video on YouTube called... Uh, that says, um, Stop Selling Your Music. And he got really bent out of shape about it. And I told him, I said, well, there's no royalties from it. It's, um, d d so there's no reason to, to s you don't make money from selling records any anyways. And he's a famous musician, actually. And I said that it's more worth it if you started a Patreon-style Patreon thing, which I call artist funding. And you made your own videos because um, because your entire life's work is what you're selling. And it's worth way more than what anyone would, than any record label would pay you, your measly thing of something that doesn't sell anything. And they're not going to pay you anyways. Um, so the idea of... of um, the thing that's worth something now is um, is your um, like how you can promote it through things like this, things like YouTube or whatever, or Twitch or Instagram or whatever you do. Um, people become influencers or whatever they are, you know. Uh, if you have, you know, 500,000 Instagram subscribers, a million Instagram subscribers, there's people that will pay you to, uh, 
um, that will pay you to put a post out. I had this this uh, some people in here. One of the last things that I did, maybe it was last year, year and a half ago, I can't remember now, that we had this TV show that was on YouTube Red, and one of the singers is a dancer, and she had a YouTube channel with, um, hey, Amadeo, had a, a um, uh, had a YouTube channel with, I don't know, a million, not YouTube, but an Instagram channel with, a million subscribers? Something like that. Maybe it wasn't a million. It was a lot. I want to say that she said she said something like, P companies will pay her to make a post, will pay her $100,000, $50,000 to make a post. Now, that's a tremendous amount of people that watch her videos. She does dance routines. Um, I'm not saying that everybody can get like that, but it's far greater to, uh, far more worth it for you to sell your music by promoting it through, um, by promoting it through, um, through other avenues, whatever it might be. Um, Thanks for Pelini. What's that? Neil? Are you in the band or something? <laughs> no, you, could, you might be in the band. Uh, probably a million subs then. Well, the amount of money that you get paid from, from record sales has been so dramatically reduced. I mean, money that I made as a producer from having gold records, platinum records, you get a you get one big check usually, and the, all of a sudden, then they just get smaller and smaller. And now, you know, things that maybe ten years ago you might get, uh, well, you get a big check when you recoup a record. So let's say you do, a, um, let's say you make a record. This is back in the 15 years ago. Let's say you make a record with, um, let's say it's 10 songs and you get paid $3,000 a piece and you get three points on it. So, they advance you $30,000 to make the records, typically more than that. Thank you, Chris. Um, what do I think of iPod's involvement in the music industry? I'll, I'll get to that. So you, until you recoup that, so the way that you would recoup that money historically is that the band, a new band, and I would typically work with new bands, they would get a 13% of, of the... Uh, net income that would be part of their deal. So let's say that a record is $10 uh, and they get 13%. So they get a buck 30. Well, out of that 13%, they have to pay me, the producer, whoever the producer is, three points, and then they have to pay a mixer one point. This is how it used to be. It's not this way anymore. Well, I mean, it's theoretically this way, I guess. But um, So... I recoup my, out of that, out of those points, so they're getting 90 cents a record. I'm getting 30 cents a record. A point is a percentage point. When people say points, they mean percentage points. But I'm getting one, I'm getting three percentage points of $10, so 30 cents a record, okay? Um, so... Out of you have to sell enough records to recoup that thirty thousand dollars, and until you hit that thirty thousand dollar mark, uh, you you don't make any royalties, so they hold it in escrow, and um, 
the record has to recoup or they have to recoup that money first before you get paid any money. So typically, even on a gold record, it would typically, like the records I did would take about five years to recoup. This is when people actually, um, when it, when people actually used to buy records. This is before streaming. We're, we're going back about to 2007 to 2012, something like that. So, um, so when a record would recoup, some of the some of the records I did, I'd do 16 tracks or so, it'd be $48,000. And it would take, you know, so you do the record and the money's making, they're making way more money than that. So let's say a band sells 500,000 records. Well, that's $5 million. Now the label finds all these ways to not pay you. And they keep telling you that every, the, the, the royalty statements are super complex. I've talked about this in the past. I'm talking about this in a long time. But the royalty statements would be so complicated. They'd have so many different things. And you'd never know. You could never tell if it if it was true or not. And you couldn't audit the label. The band could audit the label, but you can't. I couldn't audit the label. I guess I could as a producer, but it's not worth it. You wouldn't ever audit a label unless you were a band that was near the end of their contract or something or knew that there was money. Because you, you anytime you audited the label it would cost a lot of money and you would get typically get money cuz they would all uh they would they would always rip rip the artist off <laughs> you know they'd always rip off the producers so uh so eventually you reach a point where they uh, with every record that recouped i had to get my lawyer to go to the label and say, uh, well, I'll give you an example. So I had a, a, a record with a band that, that was, uh, I knew was long recouped. And every time they said, oh, you've got, you know, you've got $48,000 in escrow or whatever, meaning that they're going to pay you this money, with recoup, but you're a thousand, you're $1,600 unrecouped or you're, then, then, then six months later, you only get a statement every six months. Then you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna get that forty-eight thousand dollars. This is this is like ten years ago at the time, you know. I'm gonna get that forty forty-eight thousand dollars. The next statement, but no, the next statement, I'm twelve hundred dollars on recoup. It's like what? There's no way that this record didn't make that mu that money. So, I I remember going to my lawyer Reed and saying, Reed, listen, can you tell these guys you? He's friends with all the business affairs people. Tell them that I will pay out of my pocket the twelve hundred dollars to get the forty eight thousand. Okay, and he says, "Okay." Um, so he goes then, and he goes, "Oh, well, I talked to them. Now I'm paying my lawyer to go to them, right? So me calling him, he I get charged. So in addition to just to find out about if they'll do this." Because I know it's really, then, then he comes back and he says, oh, well, they said that you're recouped, <laughs> right? It's like, well, why didn't they say I was recouped on the statement? Well, they're recouped, I'm recouped because my lawyer, Reed, is friends with the, the head of business affairs there. And he does a lot of business with them with some huge artists and they don't want to get him mad because he has all these famous clients. All right. So then they say, oh, you're recouped. And then they send me the $48,000. Okay. And, but then the next, then, then. Six months later, and once you recoup, then you get a you get a check every six months. But the next check's like two thousand dollars, and then the next check after that is is fifteen hundred dollars, and then the next check after that is eight hundred dollars, and then the next check after that's like five hundred bucks, and then it's just kind of five hundred bucks uh, every six months for years. But that's it. <laughs> you know, like. Um, even though the records, you know, even, even at that time when records were still selling, you know that the records were selling, but there's nothing you could, you know, like you just, you just take the 500 bucks and you just, you know, you don't expect anything. And it's only the big people that, um, that were constantly making platinum records that would have the big producer managers that could royalty crickets. I like that dub that could actually 
say, oh, well, I'm not going to work on that record. Well, they just wouldn't screw around with those people because uh, they needed them. The Chris Lord Elgies, whoever they are, Brendan O'Brien's, people like that. They, people that would had all the big hit multi-platinum records, they wouldn't mess around with them. I got into the business after everybody had made, when I got into the business right at the end when people, if you had a platinum record you, or if you had a triple platinum record, you could make a million dollars as a producer and you're, you'd make $300,000 per million typically. But, uh, you know, by the time I started establishing myself as producer, record sales had already started to plummet because they started plummeting in the year 2000 or that was the top of the industry. And then they've, they've steadily gone down. Um, and streaming has replaced a lot of the income for the labels, but it never really did it for, for other people, for producers or anything, you know? Um, so, um, so that whole thing is just a racket. It's always been a racket. And the only people that got paid are people that were in demand that could, um, that could tell people that, or, or they just wouldn't mess with them. Um, yeah, Napster did start, start the demise of it. It did. But, I mean, it was inevitable. If it wasn't Napster, it was someone else. You know, files are just too small to... Um, files are too small to... to uh, you know, they're just so easy to, to... They were so easy to steal. Um, do I think records or labels are scared, scared of Patreon? No. Not at all. Um, no. No. They don't care about Patreon. Um, record labels still control a lot of the main... Um, they still control, you know, things on YouTube. You know, all the demonetization that happens with my videos, with, ev with everyone's videos, not just my videos, but with everyone's videos. Um, most of the big biggest channels on YouTube, for example, are like Vivo, you know, things like that. They're music related channels. They're huge. Um, and so they're making, the labels are making money on that. They're making money, you know, three or four labels own Spotify, or maybe three labels, I think, own Spotify. Um, um, and then the artist, money, but, but then again, but even in that case, uh, the money is, um, most of the new acts, all, all, all the new acts signed 360 deals. So, um, which means that the labels get X amount of their live money revenue as well. They figure they spend the money to promote them. So they want to be able to take money on the back end, even from live performance. What happened to the latest theory video? You just made it? Never got a chance to download? I don't know what you're talking about. Did something happen to my latest theory video? Couldn't have. You've been on Patreon for a couple of years, zero dollars. Guess super fetch is an acquired taste. Um, the record industry is resisting so hard to keep their old revenue streams with CDs, tapes. They look like they're hanging out with their fingernails for years. So what are producers to do to make up for the huge loss of income? Well, the front end changed. I mean, that's the thing that, that as revenue started to drop, people, the big producers that used to make 100, you know, get paid $3,000 a track, and then they get their points in the back end would make a ton of money in the back end. They're getting people demanding Max Martin, a hundred thousand dollars a track plus publishing, you know, they'd write the track and they would charge a hundred grand, but the labels know that the hit song is worth millions of dollars. You know, the reason that, uh, the, um, the judgment in the Pharrell Robin Thicke case was $5.3 million and not $7 million. I'm sure the reason is that they, they went to them and said, well, the only money that was made on this was $5.3 million. And uh, that that's pretty much how he... Um, 
that that's that tells you how much money that song generated. Um, okay, where's your super chat question here? There it is, Chris. What do I think the iPod pod's involvement in the music industry? The iPod. Well, um, well, the you know the iPod. You, you know, I have a friend here in Atlanta that ran a, a big uh, internet service provider. Um, one of the early ones that was huge. And his company was bought out for $3 billion, okay? And he became the CEO of, of another big internet service provider. You would know the name if I said. He lives here in Atlanta. Uh, I should get him on a show. So he says, um, so the guy that developed the iPod came to him first before Apple with his idea for an MP3 player. So he was the CEO of this company and he went out and he made started making deals with other, with major record labels about this and they were going to put the store through his company that he was the CEO of. So he brought it up to the board and they that they wanted I don't know a couple million dollars investment money to do this and the board denied him and he resigned from the company from being CEO and then this guy that had the iPod design I mean I think I totally believe this is true uh, went to Steve Jobs and presented it to him and he still works for Apple and uh, that he took the design of the player and they went there and they put the things through the iTunes store and Steve Jobs negotiated the deals um, the with the labels and told them, yeah, we're going to keep 30% of everything. So 30 cents on the dollar, right? A third, basically. Um, now, the labels agreed to this in what year? 2001 or something when the iPod came out? Um. Yeah, I don't think Johnny uh, designed the iPod, actually. I think he's designed other things, but I don't think the initial design was him. M might have been. Uh, maybe that. Maybe that's who came to them. But, um, um, so, Steve Jobs convinced these labels, because they didn't think that this MP3 thing was going to take off. It's the same thing guys, a lot of the same guys at these labels still run, you know, running them, you know, not all of them, but a few of them are the same people that made the decision to give away a third of their profits to Apple. It was ridiculous. Um, totally ridiculous. So, um, so what did it do to the industry? Well, when people could carry around their entire music collection on a thing that's, you know, that big, um, it changed everything. And I remember. It was e it, actually, it was easy to put things on it. Pretty easy. Um, it, it became harder and harder. Uh, and that was, that was it, pretty much. When college kids realized that they could share stuff over Napster and you know, look, if the internet was, was faster, quicker, the movie industry would have been in the same boat as the, as the, um, as the music industry. But they learned from the music industry because people couldn't download, they couldn't, up, or they couldn't upload, you know, a gig and download a gig. Nobody had that kind of space. You didn't have hard drives. Well, I told you I was going through hard drives earlier. Well, the, the, Hard, some of the hard drives I have are are 60 gigs. Maybe not even 60 gigs. Probably less than that. From around 2000. But I have... Um, um, the video rental business 
got crushed. Yeah, that's true. But later, later on, after the... What's up, Monty? So, um, so yeah, so the iPod, you know, I mean, that's... iPod's just a way to store MP3s. Um, but the idea of, of, uh, yeah, okay, there you go, Joe. Computer in 2013 gig hard drive. Cody, now that you don't produce, do you feel like you have wasted money on gear? No, of course not. Um, no, I buy new gear. I record stuff all the time. I record stuff for my videos. <laughs> You've seen videos where I've recorded amplifiers and drums and things like that. I record, I'm constantly recording. I need the gear that, uh, that I have. Not true. You're downloading movies in college. Yeah. You, you may have been downloading movies in college, but it, it was not easy for people to do. And it, you weren't able to get massive amounts of, you know, everything was available out there in mu music wise. And they arrested people for giving it away. You know, some people, not many, but um so yeah. Um but there wasn't enough bandwidth and not much capacity on hard drives. Exactly. Exactly. Um, people used to have, you know, you'd run into people, oh, I've got, I've got, you know, 10 gigs of MP3s. And, I mean, I know people that just, music industry people that would just steal all their music. Was Lars a hero or zero? Um... You know, I have a friend that um, that managed an artist that I worked with, uh, and his name is Corey Smith. Corey, uh, well, my friend's name is Marty, but Marty managed Corey Smith this is years ago. And, and um, when Marty started managing him, they they had a strategy. He's, he, Marty's down here from um, from Monroe, Georgia. And their strategy was to take his biggest songs and give them away to people. So he would give away CDs. And the idea of giving them away was so that people would come to the shows and they would share them, kind of like people share tapes of Fish or whoever. And, um, and Corey did these college songs and you know, a lot about lyrics about Georgia and things like that and Developed a huge following and made a lot of money. And people would come and sing to sing all of his songs. And it was counterintuitive at the time because this is going back to the early 2000s. Give away your music. That was his thing. Um, and develop your following because the money was in live performance. And, uh, and that was very smart. It was way, way ahead of its time. And, um, but that is, you know, that's the market, that's the model right now. The model is that music is free, basically. Now, I pay for Apple Music, Spotify, and I think Amazon or something, music, whatever. So I'm paying 30 bucks a month. What's up, Ray? I'm paying 30 bucks a month to, um, so it's like buying three albums a month. Um, and that's how I support whoever I'm supporting. I mean, I hope the money, some of that money goes to the artists, but, um, you know, did you used to buy that's like buying an album a month. I mean, if you if you pen, pay $10 for Spotify, that's like buying one album a month or 12 albums a year. Well, did people buy 12 albums a year? Is that pretty much the, uh, 
the going rate or the going thing. Did I buy, used to buy 12 albums a year? Well, I used to buy more than 12 albums a year, I think. Um, three albums a month. Yeah. I mean, that's about, that's about right. Um, you bought and bought more Derek when you used to buy albums. Um, well, you know, that's the, um, That's the, I mean, the labels are probably keeping all that money anyways. That's why they're only singles. You'd rather the artist had a GoFundMe page and they get 100% of the money. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, ultimately, that's what artists need to do. A local club guy hit by, by BMI and ASCAP. I've heard they do that, but, um, and I know I've got a friend that pays BMI and ASCAP. He owns a club. You're 40 and you, you bought 10 CDs a week. You have friends that drag away, bo drag around box of cassettes. You got to share music. I know it was amazing. I was one of those people that did that. Um, let's see. Uh, recording questions? I, I can't read that. Um... Steph, Steven, he says that, Mark, no one wants to listen to music with each other anymore. That's not true. You know, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> the other day, Tommy, thank you. Appreciate that. That's very nice. So the other day, Dylan was home from school on Friday, and so um, I'm down here working, and I go upstairs and I say, I know it's time to eat lunch. And I go upstairs and it's about one o'clock or something. I said, Dylan, you want to go? Let's go have lunch. You want to go have lunch? And he goes, well, I don't want to go where you want to go. And I said, well, I, how do you know where I want to go? I wanted to, I was going to say, let, let's go to lunch where you want to go. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, there you go. Like, I don't want to go where you want to go. Well, I didn't even suggest any place. So, um... I said, uh, I said, where do you want to go? And he goes, I said, where do you want to go? And he says, I don't know. So I said, well, let's go get a burrito. And he goes, okay, fine. So we go up to the Chipotle, up the street, and uh, we go in there, and, and Dylan says, uh, we get the food. And I realize I've never been out to eat with just Dylan, ever, never. You'd think, he's 11 years old, you'd think that I'd been out with just him. I've been out with all three kids plenty of times, but not just, not just me and Dylan ever. So I'm realizing that. And so Dylan gets his food and it was weird because Dylan was, you know, just see him in a place by himself. He's standing next to me. He's almost as tall as I am. So he says, uh, he, he gets a, gets his kid's burrito with, uh, with some beans and rice. And, uh, so he goes, well, we're not going to eat it here, are we? And I said, why not eat it here? Why bring the stuff home? And then we got to throw out the mess. Let them clean up the mess afterwards. Let's sit down and eat. I'm hungry now. And he's like, all right. So we sit down and, and Dylan says, uh, and Dylan is, is sitting there. And as soon as we sit down, he's got his phone. Dylan's got a phone, right? He got a phone because he takes a bus to school. And uh, if we can't get to the bus or it gets delayed because it's a 20-minute ride and there's this thing picking up the three kids are all within a mile of each other, three different schools. And if his bus is late, if it's not timed perfectly, Dylan could be.
And he says, um, uh, and he says, uh, or so he has this, he has a phone. I bought him a phone this year. And as soon as we sit down, he, he has got his phone and he's just like, <laughs> like, I said, Dylan, put that phone down. What are you doing? I'm trying to talk to you. And, uh, and, oh, oh, okay. I said, can't you have a conversation while you're eating? And he says, uh, yeah, 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 that's, uh, okay. And he's, and then he's eating and then he's eating and I'm kind of, I'm, I sneak a, uh, I pick up my phone. He's like, what are you doing? I said, nothing, but I was taking pictures of him because it was, I was cracking up just watching him eat. I haven't even looked at him yet, but, uh, but it was just, I wanted to kind of capture the moment. I really wanted to cap capture the moment with, uh. I'm sorry if it's buffering, everybody. I didn't know. I don't know. I don't know why it's buffering, but it's buffering. Anyway, so that was my... Um, that was my trip with Dylan to go eat lunch. I thought that was pretty funny, though. Um... Um, I thought it was this end. Wait. Day of buffering of yours. Have I listened to brand brand new? Yes. How much has food affected your music? It's affected my waistline. Um. Is there, uh, uh, let's see here. Everyone needs to do a YouTube search for Dylan Sings Zeppelin. You won't be sorry. Oh, Dylan used to sing Zeppelin. Do I have a YouTube video of that? I might have put that up on my channel. He was a he was a little kid. He'd run around with his guitar and sing Led Zeppelin. Um, um, on my brother's channel. Really? Interesting. My brother has a channel? <laughs> That's pretty funny. I think my brother does have a channel. Hey, Peter. Um, he has a Dylan Sing Zeppelin? Wow. Um, two videos. Oh, man. I bet it's from us FaceTiming. I bet Dylan put it up there. It's there. Wow, interesting. Immigrant song and Black Dog? It's under Giambiato. Um Wow, from 2010. Okay, so Dylan was 3. 2 years old. Okay, yeah, 2 years old. That is hilarious. And he's singing Black Dog. Oh, I got to watch it. I got to watch it. That's um he sings the guitar riffs. Oh man, Dylan is left-handed. Yes, um, he's probably better than Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> I didn't know Dylan's ear was as good as it was at the time. I always used to think, man, Dylan's got those notes on on Zeppelin. He's maybe Dylan's gonna be a singer. Uh, there's the link. Where's there a link? Somebody post the link. Left hand people special, you know, because you're one of them. Um, has anyone ever told me that I look like I have a Robert Downey Jr.? People have told me I look like Robert Downey Jr. Um, can't link in the chat. Well, look it up. I'm. I'm gonna. I'll look it up. I, I want to see it. I can't even. I don't even remember it. Maybe I'll put it on my channel or something. Um, first name, last name, what's up? Um, wait, 
Well, you even talk like him, so there's that's why you ask. I talk like Dylan or I talk like my brother? There's the link. You see the resemblance. John's channel is going to blow up now. That's hilarious. Um, I forgot. You know, I knew that Dylan sang Zeppelin on video chat with John one time, and I but I I thought. I didn't. Re I thought I had the video, and then I never saw it again. I was. I. I remember thinking, you know, there's a video of Dylan singing some Zeppelin songs. Is he playing with his guitar? It has 37 views right now. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. He's like, oh yeah, oh I need to record this. I need to record this. And uh, and I remember Dylan doing it. And I'm sure that Dylan. I don't know if he was singing along with the thing. If he was singing along with it, how is it still up on YouTube if it's um, if it's Zeppelin? Well, probably because he doesn't have any subscribers. Yeah, 370,000 in two days. Um, I wonder if he wasn't singing. When he, you know, when I think back to it, when he didn't have the music on, he has 10 subscribers now. He's gone up. Okay. When, when he was... If I go back and I watch videos of Dylan singing songs back then, now, um, oh, they won't block it if if uh, if it doesn't have if he's not tagged Zeppelin. Uh, when I go back and watch Dylan sing songs back when he's two years old, he sings um, he sings the songs perfectly in key. It just wasn't obvious to me then. Um, which is pretty, um, which is pretty interesting because he definitely, um, he definitely had perfect pitch then. You're used to some people singing in key, <laughs> Frank. I'm not used to that many people singing in key. Um, did I ever see the band Failure live? I did see them, Jeff. I saw them play at the Cotton Club here in Atlanta, which used to be on Peachtree Street. I saw them play in 96. They were touring with Fantastic Planet on that record. And it was a club that held 600 people. And they were the headliner. And, um, they were, um, they were um, really good. The... I I th I think that record is brilliant, and I've talked to the to the singer Ken Andrews about about doing a um, what makes the song great. He doesn't have the files, um. So, because he did it on ADAT and he mixed it on a Mackie sixteen oh eight, believe it or not, and it sounds phenomenal. So, um, I remember though on the single "Stuck on You," the bass player plays chords in the chorus. And that's what it what it uh, it sounds so heavy. Um, was that Mike? Um, somebody asked me, uh, do I still produce? I don't produce, no. I don't actively book, no, I don't actively or passively book stuff. Um, all right. Do I have a Zappa story? Do you have your Zappa story? I don't have a Zappa story, really. I have a Dweezil Zappa story, no. I mean, I know Dweezil, but I don't have a Dweezil Zappa, I don't have a Zappa story. No, but somebody wrote to me today about, um, that I, about my, um, Jeff Buckley story. Um, when I met Jeff Buckley at, uh, at a club here in Atlanta and talked to him for an hour back in 96. Used to go see him play all the time 
in New York City at Cheney, which was one block away from where I lived. Um, you know, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start doing some some solo uh, videos on people. Like, I want to do a video on Hendrix if I can play it. But I went to Hendrix's grave. I want to say, and when he was turned fifty in ninety, ninety two, maybe ninety three. 92. I've got pictures from me being at Hendrix's grave in, in Seattle. Um, I've been looking for those, but um, I want to just have Hendrix page. You know, um, whatever, Vi. Uh, Martin, you like the hi hat rant. Um, I love it when people say that, you know, a couple of people say, oh, you're old. And I say, uh, it sounds great. You're just old. And I say, no, you need to go to, uh, to an audiologist because you, uh, you can't hear above 10 K apparently. So, um, if you think that sounds good, you are you're you've lost your high end. Um I went to the gym this morning and I was I don't wear earphones very often. I don't wear, wear headphones. Um but uh I was listening to the top top twenty on Spotify and uh and I listen to that Halsey song again, Within Me, or with Without Me, I mean, Within Me, Without Me. And, uh, yeah, so well produced. I, I'm just a sucker for pop songs, I hate to say it. It's, uh, it has some beautiful layers in it. Even it's the same four chords and everything, but it's, the melody, ha the chorus melody has really good um, shape to it really does um joe part of the reason why new acts is it partly due to being no a and r and artists yeah that's that's why there's that's exactly why hey jeff beato you like ship some free clip on tuners for endorsement who's jeff beato Halsey's one of the only modern things that you, uh, oh, bad joke. Uh, how can I stomach it while working out? I really, uh, when I'm working out, it makes me focus on the, the panning of things. That's why, um, that's, that's the good thing about headphones. You know, if you wear headphones to mix, though, you'll never, you don't pan things as wide. I want to do a video on panning. Um, I think, though, after my cicada video, people think I'm panning something. Like, uh, am I doing a low-carb diet? Why do you ask that? I am doing a diet. Tom, what's up? You're right. The production is great on some of these pop songs. It really is. You got to, you can't, people that hate pop music, uh, I'm looking thin, awesome. I have a bet going on with Layla that I can lose um, like 30 pounds in two months. So, and my, this is my diet that I'm, I'm doing right now. It's just intermittent fasting. It's just only eating between 12 and 7. That's it. That's it. It's good for you. So I haven't eaten since uh, since 7 o'clock. I'm not, not really eating low carb or anything. Um, but it's, uh, it's intermittent fasting is really good for you. Tom, you've been in the mountains in New Mexico with no connection. That's good. That's good. Um, intermittent fasting is a good diet. Yes. 
I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. Fasting is good. Juicing, I love juicing too. What was my first concert? Um, oh man, I don't even remember. Don't even remember. It's so, uh, I mean, it was 40 years ago. I don't even know. I remember I saw Aerosmith, Toys in the Attic. Um, that was probably first big concert. Maybe. I don't know. I don't remember. So, um, I don't smoke anything, no. Um, I don't smoke anything, Tom. Jay Years was a Metallica at, in 1997. Man. Simon and Garfunkel, Def Leppard, Bjork. Wait. Offspring, Aerosmith, Queen, Love the Hoople. Wow. Will I do a video on compression? Already done it, Uncle Jane. I have a very long video on compression. It's like uh, 40 minutes long. Um, 1981 Genesis. There you go. I saw Frampton in the 70s. Um, I saw Guar play here in the 90s. I saw Frampton in 76, I think. Horse with no name, what makes this song great? I'm not sure that I would do that song from America. I'm not sure that America would do well on that. Obviously, I don't have uh, I don't have any tracks or anything, but I like Sandman, not Tin Man. You know Sandman? I understand you've been running from the man that goes by the name of the Sandman. He flies the sky like an eagle in the eye of a hurricane that's abandoned. I think that's the lyric. You guys know that song? It's on the... Um, you know it. George Martin plays piano on Tin Man. Tin Man is a great song, but... The first song I learned on guitar was an America song. Come on, I've told that story to you guys, right? I got my guitar here. Hold on. Let me, uh, whoa, hold on. I gotta lower my, uh, I gotta lower my, my stand here. Give me one second here. Turn it around. Uh, there we go. So my first song I ever learned on the guitar was off the first America record, ironically, right? And it was, uh, I loved it because it was uh, Never Found the Time. And the first chord I learned... set up badly. Um, yeah, this guitar has got needs to... Uh, need to... Uh, my buddy Dave's coming tomorrow. I'm going to let him take it with him. Uh, 
I'm trying to think of uh... <laughs> between G and E minor and the verse is such a great, it's a beautiful song. Um, that is a, um, that's in, uh, in, uh, so that's like the first chord I learned on the guitar was G sus four. But, um, I love, it's got a beautiful piano part on it. I'm gonna go listen to that record. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, okay. Too many questions. Okay. I, I'm tired. I'll read these after. Um, you guys are the best.